welcome back and certainly a very warm one. Jeffrey has been at the CIP, CIP two years ago as one of the speakers at our Leisure Environment Symposium. So quite a few of you probably have uh, had a chance to know him in that occasion. I imagine that of those of you who are too uh, junior to, to have been here two years ago, uh, quite a few of you may have been familiar with Jeffrey through his writing. He has a very important series of contributions to architectural literature and theory and criticism. Uh, he has published very many articles in uh, periodicals in England and uh, I would say in most major architectural journals. In 1969, he was co-editor of a very influential book called Design Methods in Architecture. And also 1969 is a contribution of his in a book called Meaning in Architecture, edited by James and Bird. These two early works have identified him as one of the leading theorists, both in the field of design method and in the field of meaning in architecture. Perhaps his major contribution so far is a book, Design in Architecture, published in 1973. And uh, currently, Jeffrey is working in an amazing number of very important projects. Uh, he's editing a book along with Charles Jenks and uh, Dick Band called Signs, Symbols and Architecture. At the same time, he's uh, finishing the final uh, manuscript, final draft for a book to be called The Nature of Architectural Revolutions. And uh, the topic he's going to develop tonight, Architecture and Ideology, is as a matter of fact the last segment of that book which he has just completed. And I was very pleased to hear that we have the privilege of being the first audience to whom this particular uh, presentation has been made or is going to be made. He's also working in his uh, following uh, book, which will be called The History of Architectural Design. And if this was not a workload impressive enough, he's working on another book to be called, uh, we don't know yet what, but he's going to be a reader in the psychology of meaning in architecture and he's working in this project with Thomas Jorens. Uh, I said before that Jeffrey needs no presentation, however, I could not stop the temptation of being here presenting him because this is such a big pleasure for me to do. I have had the privilege of working for two years under Jeffrey at the Portsmouth School of Architecture in England, uh, of which he is the head. And, uh, I want to share with you that I have been influenced by few persons in my professional life as strongly as by Jeffrey, and I have been enriched by few people as much as I have been by him. Uh, I also want to say you a little bit about uh, Jeffrey the man. Uh, Jeffrey has very many nice qualities, and one of the uh, most uh, impressive ones is his passionate love for arguments. Jeffrey uh, can get really close to somebody when he can get involved in a good uh, uh, demolishing uh, uh, endless uh, argument. This is what he, he likes to do the most. So uh, he asked me, are we going to have any discussion tonight? And I said, yes, sure. Uh, we have a couple of young, very bright faculties who will uh, make you one question or two. And I even gave him the names of those faculties. And uh, uh, he said, well, that's fine, but uh, uh, couldn't we have some discussion during the, during the presentation itself? Could, do you think they, they, they will interrupt me? I said, well, I don't, I don't think they will. Uh, we usually don't do that. And he said, that's a pity. I had been in Venezuela last time, and uh, uh, students were very involved in what I was saying. And in the middle of the presentation, they started the screaming, shouting, go and go home. And it was marvelous. And uh, I said, well, I may ask my students to ask some questions at the end, and I'm willing to do that, but I'm afraid that if I ask them to shout, go up and go home in the middle of the lecture, they just won't do it. I know them, they won't do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, Jeffrey, I am very uh, pleased and very happy to, to have you uh, here with us tonight. Thank you very much. 
much indeed for that, Juan. Uh, many of the things Juan said about me, I would also say about him. That the few people I've worked with, I've enjoyed talking to so much. We didn't actually argue, as far as I remember. We agreed on most things and gently agreed to disagree on some others, but we didn't have that kind of interaction you were talking about. As far as coming to Muncie is concerned, it certainly is a great pleasure. I'm only sorry that the visit is so short. When I first came, I thought that like any other place, inviting a visiting speaker, you were taking a risk. Well, you took that risk two and a half years ago, and I think to have me back again is some kind of masochism. But here I am in any case. Now, Juan mentioned that the talk I'm going to give this evening is the first ever. I haven't even tried it out on my own students. So if I do funny things during the course of the talk, that's because I'm thinking it through as I go along. I have been writing about this subject over the summer, and uh, when I knew I was going to come to the United States uh, at this time of the year, I sent around a list of titles of the talks that I would like to give. Um, nobody actually mentioned this one in the feedback I got. Uh, I got some of the others from my list, which I got fully prepared, all the slides in order and those things. So uh, it was a pleasant surprise that uh, Muncie asked me to give this talk um, on, on this particular subject of architecture and ideology. But as Juan mentioned, I do very much like to uh, have discussion on these things. I'm exploring a set of ideas. One of the reasons I come to places to give talks is to discuss them before I finally write them down in book form. So please, if you think I'm talking nonsense, do shout out and say so. We can discuss it at the time, because I want to get it right for the book, and I need your help. <laughs> well, as Juan said, the book that we're talking about is called The Nature of Architectural Revolutions, and you recognize the title as really taken from Thomas Kuhn, who wrote the book called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. It's been in progress for about four years, and it started as a series of chapters left over from design and architecture. I'd simply written too much, and the publisher asked me to cut it down, and I said, not on your word, uh, not on your life. I like most of the words in that book, and I won't cut any of them out. But that meant that I had part of a manuscript left over with no proper theoretical structure. So for quite a long time, I've been struggling hard to put the thing together. And I realized over the years that there was a gap in the middle of it, which is exactly this issue, the ideological nature of architecture, the relationship of architecture to politics. Uh, one of the things that triggered this was, as Juan mentioned, my experience in talking to people from a little further north in South America than where he comes from, who have a tendency to turn every discussion, whatever the subject, into a political one. Um, and uh, in that case, if we're talking about architecture, for instance, the discussion becomes a matter of politics. That's what they teach their students as well. And it interests me to, to find that that's the case, that people should feel that politics is so important compared with architecture, that I began to ask some questions uh, about what actually happened. If they held some very strong political beliefs, then wouldn't that actually show in the architecture they did? The people I'm talking about are what Charles Jenks uh, describes very nicely as Lamborghini Marxist. <laughs> and the point at issue, I finally said, well, look, you must uh, resolve all of this by making some architectural design. Supposing we had the revolution that you're looking for and your country changed and the whole of the na national resources of the country of Venezuela were distributed equally amongst yourselves and the people who live in the shanties around the city and the Indians who live in the jungle, wouldn't it be an interesting architectural problem to design the housing type that was suitable for everybody? And they said, that's nonsense, not a problem at all. But the next day they came along and they said, well, we realize that you posed us with a realistic problem and we should solve that one, shouldn't we? And we will sometime design that house. Of course, there will be exceptions as to who should live in it. Uh, which was really the answer I was expecting. So it was discussions of that sort that uh, led me to think it would be a good idea to uh, look further into the nature of ideology and the nature of architecture. And another reason I wanted to tackle this is that uh, a great many of the buildings that are classed as the great historical monuments in architectural history, such as the pyramids, 
of course, have some extremely powerful motivations behind them of a political, social, religious sort. And if we could have the lights down a little, we can see the slides more clearly. The pyramids, for instance. The first pyramid was built uh, outside Cairo in about 2800 BC, and it was literally an expression of the power of the pharaoh. He had control over the irrigation of the river Nile, uh, and as an expression of that absolute control, he also could control the people who lived in the country, bring them to a central point to work on his tomb. Interestingly enough, the tomb itself finished up in the traditional shape that we now talk about when one man is at the top of the pyramid and he's controlling all kinds of other people at the lower levels. Uh, the pyramid form itself is a direct expression of a political situation. And it's true also of System. Our other monuments in architectural history too. For instance, everyone knows that the Parthenon was commissioned by Pericles as uh, a great politician in the city of Athens. His political rivals were actually richer than he was and could afford to spend more money on beautifying the city and therefore getting more votes. Uh, Pericles simply embezzled money paid into the state of Athens to pay for a fleet and built the Parthenon with it. So the building itself has political manipulation uh, uh, behind it. Or, again, it's happened with the world's great religions, that as they've advanced over the face of the earth, so they have built particular building types to express their presence. This is the mosque of Sultan Hassan in Cairo, and it demonstrates the presence of Islam in the city of Cairo in around the 12th century or the Cathedral of Saint-Denis outside Paris. Again, there's a perfectly adequate language of architecture available at this time uh, in the Romanesque, the round arched architecture of the Romanesque. But Abbot Suger, uh, who's also the regent of the country of Kingdom of France, when the king is fighting the Crusades, wants particularly to develop an architectural language which will express his own power. And for that reason, the Gothic style itself is developed as a, uh, out of the Romanesque. And it's interesting to plot the, the, the building of the Gothic cathedrals across the face of northern France, marking the expansion of the territory of that kingdom as, um, as they advance across, across Europe. Also, near the beginnings of the Renaissance, the Pazzi Chapel, uh, Brunelleschi, the Pazzi were one of the great uh, families in, the, in Florence at the time, and they too were seeking a particular mode of architectural expression to show their place in the political and social and economic scheme of things. Or it's true in the East as well. Uh, the, the, the kings of Thailand don't bear thinking about in terms of what they did to the countryside, but again they have to express their presence the presence of their particular brand of Buddhism by the temples that they built too. So the point is that uh, the, the, there have been these easily recognizable changes over the history of architecture, and the standard histories like Bannister Fletcher, for instance, are simply catalogues of changes in architectural form. We usually call those things style, but over the past 50 years or so, the word style itself has become rather suspect and there were people at the beginning of the modern movement in architecture who felt that if you state the architectural problem clearly enough and analyze it thoroughly, then somehow a perfect solution, will, a perfect design solution will emerge automatically out of that statement of the problem. What's interesting is that the buildings they design, having argued that way, all tend to look the same. They're very square, cubic, all white, all glass, that kind of thing. So again, onto that uh, supposed analysis of what the building is for, still a particular kind of architectural expression is made. So as a first step in developing the argument, I thought it would be interesting to try and see if style itself can't be more firmly rooted than simply the visual appearance of architecture. And the most helpful text I found is the one I've referred to by Thomas Kuhn on the structure of scientific revolutions. 
Thomas Kuhn is saying that science also operates in a similar way, that at, at a particular moment in time, all the scientists in uh, astronomy, perhaps, or physics, or molecular biology, are interested in the same set of problems. Um, they do experiments of similar kinds. They're invited to conferences because they're doing that work. They, their work gets published in the journals because it's within the mold of what scientists do at that time. And Kuhn calls that whole package of social pressures acting on the scientists to behave in a particular way a paradigm, which is a, an interesting idea, except that, as Margaret Masterson points out, he actually describes that idea in 21 different ways in that book, which is very confusing for all of us. So she tries to reduce it. She says, well, perhaps there are three major kinds of paradigm. And he says, well, she's quite right to say that 21 is too many, but three isn't enough. Perhaps there are four. Well, the ideas they come up with are not directly ap applicable into architecture, but something very close seems to me to apply. And to paraphrase Kuhn in particular, I would say that the pressures acting on an architect at a particular moment in time are R4, in the way that he says. And first of all, just like any, anyone else dealing with uh, physical matter, we're concerned with the physical laws of the universe, what makes things stand up, how glass performs in the sun, that kind of thing. There's nothing we can do about the laws of the universe. We have to accept them and use them to our best advantage. But at least we ought to learn about them and understand them. Then the second thing, of course, is we have our own particular set of professional ethics as architects. Kuhn attaches great importance to the way that scientists are concerned with accuracy, accuracy for instance, and objectivity, uh, all those things. They're, they're kind of values that the scientists hold which bind them together into a social unit. Well, I think that's true of architects as well. We claim to be a profession, and to be a profession means that we have certain ethical standards, or should have. Then, and again like Kuhn's scientists, we share a set of techniques. Uh, we design our buildings in the same way. We make drawings, for instance. We make sketches. We make more detailed drawings. We perhaps use computer programs these days. But there is a set of techniques available to us which you would expect any architect to understand and to know about and to use. So those are, those are three components of the architectural paradigm, if you like, this rather broader thing than style that I'm trying to explore. The physical laws of the universe, which apply to us all in any case, the professional standards we've got, the set of techniques available to us, and then I decided that the last of the four things acting on us uh, undoubtedly was an ideology, which is really why I began to use that word in the title. Well, the idea of ideology itself is an interesting one, and it goes back to the 18th century and to 18th century philosophy. And just to put it into context, let me outline a thing which I also do in the book called Design and Architecture, which is to explain the importance for the understanding of architecture of two uh, very different philosophical streams, one of which is called rationalism, and the other which is called empiricism. And rationalism, on the whole, is, uh, certainly since the 17th century, has been a province of the French, René Descartes and others, who mistrust the evidence of the senses. They believe that, Descartes himself says, or to paraphrase Descartes, how do I know I'm here in Muncie, Indiana, giving a lecture? How do I know I'm not asleep in my bed at home dreaming about it? I've got no real evidence to prove that at all. So we, he, he mistrusts the senses. He only believes in the truths of things he knows deep down inside himself, which can then be developed by logical argument. And that kind of thinking found its way into architecture in the middle of the 18th century with people like the Abbé Logier, who made this drawing to show, in his mind, how architecture must have started. The primitive hut, um, tree trunks, tree branches, uh, made into a sloping roof. He argued from a logical set of premises that architecture must have started like that. We now know from the archaeological evidence that he was quite wrong, but that's not the point. It was a deep inner truth for Logier, and that was good enough for him and for whole generations of successors. But the rival stream in, in uh, philosophy and in architecture 
the empirical one is concerned with the human senses, with seeing, with hearing, with smelling, with tasting, with touching, with feeling temperatures through the skin, and so on. And uh, that was developed on the whole by British philosophers. It also found its way into architectural theory in the 18th century through British architectural writers and aestheticians. And a very good example of an architect working in this way is John Nash at Brighton Pavilion. Brighton is quite close to Portsmouth. And my attempt at a psychedelic slide of it is intended just to, to show the idea of designing for sensory delight. It's a building which is delightful to look at. It's pleasant to be in. If you were invited to a banquet there in the great days, all of your senses would be stimulated in the most beautiful ways by the things you saw, the taste of the food and the wine, the music going on in the background, and so on. A total package of sensory delight. Well, I mentioned that on the whole, rationalism uh, developed in France, but of course, there were some French philosophers who rebelled just a little against that idea and had a slight respect for the English. Not all that much, but slight respect. And one of them was called Destut de Tracy, um, who believed very firmly with the English philosophers that ideas originate in the senses, in sensation. And he, for his pains, was called an ideologist by none other than Napoleon himself. Napoleon didn't believe that. Napoleon, deep, deep down, was a rationalist who believed in logical argument and the progression of ideas in that way. He was highly suspicious of these French rebel philosophers, and therefore he attached the word ideologists to them. Well, the word itself has had a checkered history since then. It was picked up by Karl Marx, who, again, developed his own logical argument as to what society ought to be like. Uh, and he, on the whole, attached the word ideologist to anybody who disagreed with him. Marx himself, and obviously I can't summarize the whole of Marx, which is an enormous range of volumes in five minutes or so, uh, but his basic argument was that human action is motivated by economic forces and that the, it's the nature of society to develop by conflict between classes uh, because of those economic forces. He goes back into the history of society and picks out a series of incidents which are not by any means the whole development of human history, just four things that interest him uh, to prove to his satisfaction the development of society uh, from slavery through feudalism, uh, through capitalism, and finally to communism, of course. And he says the key to how a society works is who controls the means of production, who owns the factories, that kind of thing. And in the 19th century, of course, he was perfectly right to be highly critical of the way that production was organized with one class of people called the bourgeoisie owning all the factories and a much larger class of people, the proletariat, working for them under rather dreadful uh, and explo exploitative conditions. Um, as far as Marx is concerned, the bourgeoisie owns the factory, owns the machinery, buys the materials, buys the time of the workers, uh, but they work rather longer than necessary simply to earn enough money to keep themselves. The capitalist puts the surplus money into his pocket, gets richer and richer. Um, the workers get poorer and poorer and more and more miserable, and then there's a revolution, he says. Except it didn't actually happen that way. Um, but after the workers seize power, they get rid of the capitalists, uh, and also, they get rid of high, the highly paid government administrators and appoint low paid ones instead. So what's tended to happen in all the societies where the Marxist, Marxist revolution has taken place is that they're run by lowly paid bureaucrats who are terribly slow and lumbering in their ways. So the thing becomes a bureaucracy rather than a state of the kind that Marx is talking about. Another important part of his prediction was that when the revolution had happened and that the uh, ownership of the means of production was in, everywhere, in, in the hands of the people, then there would be no reason for the state. There would be no reason for an army, a police force, no kind of state organization at all. Uh, that everyone would live in peace and harmony with everyone else. And there wouldn't have to be those forces uh, imposed from outside, imposed from above, uh, telling people how to 
behave. Well, that's Marx's view then, that uh, society, that the, the root driving force of society is economic forces, uh, and he used the word ideologist to describe anybody at all who disagreed with that diagnosis and thought that human affairs might be motivated by other things like religion or aesthetics or whatever. Well, most of us have uh, that kind of inkling about this word ideology, and we tend to attach it to anybody who seems to be making visionary speculations of a rather idealistic kind. Um, in many ways, that fairly loose use of the word is probably the best for our purposes. An, ide an ideologist is somebody who has um, visions of, and ideas of how things ought to be without really the practical means to carry them through. Well, the question I, uh, I, gave, I put to those Lamborghini Marxists in South America, I think is the heart of the issues I'm, I'm trying to tackle. Because if a political ideology means anything at all, as far as architecture is concerned, it ought actually to find its own architectural expression. So what I've tried to do in the book is to analyze a number of very obviously and clearly definable political systems from the 20th century and to see what architectural expression has come out of them. And the first one, of course, is the one that those people are all fighting and we call it capitalism and the United States of America is the world's capital, of course. Well, on the whole, it's a very pragmatic system and it's empirical in its views. It looks at human nature, sees what human beings are like, motivated by greed and self-interest and all those things, uh, and that's how it develops. The, insofar as there's any theory behind it, I suppose the theory was a Scotsman called Adam Smith who said that something very interesting and important happens when you divide the production of things into uh, a large range of people. He said, try making a pin. It's very difficult for you to make a pin out of a piece of wire, but if you've got a whole lot of people doing different operations with machines, you can make thousands and thousands in the course of a day. So he says, dividing up the labor into little bits and having each person do a little bit of that is much more efficient and much more effective than having the individual trying to do everything. And capitalism uh, is motivated by self-interest, but sometimes enlightened in the sense that if I do things that are good for me, it might also help somebody else as well. It's concerned with individuality, individualism, the individual himself uh, realizing or fighting for his own rights rather than having them given to him by the state. It's competitive, it's controlled by market forces, all those things. What I find interesting is that of all the political systems I looked at in the 20th century, it's the one that has the very clearest architectural expression. And it goes back to the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century with buildings like this. This is one of the middle 19th century cotton mills in Manchester, but it's rather like mills that were built 50 years earlier than that in Derbyshire, various other parts of England, with a cast iron frame cast iron columns, cast iron beams, uh, shallow brick arches, or concrete in this case, uh, simply to, uh, to make the whole thing into a fireproof building. Uh, these were the buildings, of course, where the capitalists exploited the proletariat. And the, when you read about the conditions for people who had to work in these mills, they really were quite horrific. And it's perfectly reasonable for Marx and the other 19th century opponents of that system to say the things they did. But what I find fascinating is that the building form that emerges right at the start is frame building, uh, cast iron columns, cast iron beams. And curiously enough, that kind of construction has permeated capitalist architecture ever since. You have your own developments of it in the United States, and one of the great architectural movements, of course, is not far from here, the Chicago School of Architecture, where they take uh, not iron, but rolled steel, steel rolled into our eye sections, and towards the end of the 19th century, start making frame buildings like this. It's William Le Baron Jenny, and it's the fair store in Chicago. And that comes right through. 
Where it finds its closest expression as the architecture of the capitalist system, of course, is New York City, Madison Avenue, Park Avenue, Wall Street, and Lever House, New York, is one of the first two buildings anywhere in the world to be built with a very obvious frame and clad with glass on all four sides. The United Nations has glass front and back and uh, marble panels at the ends, but this building and another building in Venezuela were made with glass all, all the way around. And very quickly, this was published in the architectural magazines, uh, because it was New York City, because New York City after the war in the early 1950s was the heart of the capitalist world, it passed around the whole of, that, the, whole of the capitalist world as the building type for the city center office. It wasn't a question of architects imposing this onto their clients, it was a question of the clients themselves also wanting it. But the frame shows through. One of the classics, of course, is the Seagram building, Mies van der Rohe, and at uh, one of the seminars this morning, I was discussing the conspicuous waste that's evident on that facade. The eye sections, which run right up to the top, are clipped onto the front of the building, in front of the curtain wall, and serve no useful purpose at all, apart from acting as rails, as someone pointed out this morning, for the cleaning trolleys that move up and down the building. But they're not structural, they don't hold the windows in, they don't project far enough from the facade to shade the windows from the sun, they're simply very expensive decoration clipped onto the exterior of the building. And the buildings themselves, of course, I know that you have an interest in the school here in design for energy conservation, solar energy, all of those things. Well, the all-glass building is the worst building type there's ever been from that point of view as the direct exhibition of the conspicuous consumption of energy. Um, I find Park Avenue, Wall Street and the rest in the very sad places these days since the energy crisis. There was a time not all that long ago when lit up in the early evening it could look like fairyland, all that electricity burning away. But now that people are more energy conscious and there are very few lights turned on, it looks terribly, terribly sad. But in all kinds of ways, it's the direct expression, I, th I think, of the capitalist view of life. There's, again, Park Avenue uh, just showing the whole proliferation of these things. Small wonder that other parts of the world, like Britain or Latin America or Australia, uh, trying to emulate your, your system from the United States should actually copy your building style as well um, to express their admiration for what you did. And in a very real sense, buildings of this sort are as much an expression of that political system as Saint-Denis or the great Gothic cathedrals across, across France generally are expressions of medieval religious faith. There's that same meaning, same kind of meaning, same kind of attachment of a sim set of symbols to the building itself. Uh, another example, the uh, John Hancock in Boston, which is cons so conspicuously wasteful that it keeps falling to pieces. <laughs> or the Avianca Airline Building in Bogota, which uh, in a sense comes full circle. This is one of the three buildings in Latin America which literally became the towering inferno. It caught fire about two floors up at eight o'clock one morning, and the panels between the windows were painted and they caught light. They would burn crack the glass on the next floor, the curtains would catch fire, the next room would catch fire as well. There were people working within that building who knew very well that if they pulled the curtains down, it would stop the spread of the fire up the building. But they, they were so afraid that the management would be angry with them in that attempt to save their lives uh, that they let the thing burn. However, that relationship between the management and the workers had other repercussions because the management quickly escaped, went out into the street and spelled out in very big letters the words, go up. And people in this kind of organization do as they're told, and they went to the top of the building, and with two exceptions, they were all taken off by helicopter. So I think it would be true to say that that particular social, political, economic system genuinely has its architecture and there's a 200 year history of it and of course it has its high priests like Mies van der Rohe and so on. Um, the question is if that is also true of 
uh, other political systems. Now, one of the interesting things is that sooner or later, and certainly over the past century or so, most political systems have built in one manner for their utilitarian purposes, and in quite a different way for their monumental buildings, their city center buildings, this kind of thing. And on the whole, whatever the political system was, they've chosen the neoclassical or some derivation of it. I was talking just now, if you remember, about Logier and the idea of the primitive hut, the hut with tree trunks for columns and uh, branches for beams and sloping roofs made out of tree branches as well. Well, uh, Logier himself said, if that was the first architecture, it also contains the essence of architecture. Uh, that being so, what we ought to do is to look back into architectural history to see which building type matches most closely that building form, then we know we've got perfect architecture. And the building he chose was, or the building type he chose, was the Greek Doric temple, the Parthenon, uh, as, as the model of absolute perfection. And Loger's argument went a good deal further than that. He said, if the essence of architecture consists of the columns and the beams and the sloping roof, then uh, that's what it should be. And if the architect is foolish enough to do more than that, he's destroying the purity of the architectural concept. Unfortunately, he said, most architects will insist on putting walls into their buildings. And once you've got walls, you have to go very much further. You've got to have windows as well, and doors, and all kinds of other licentious things. So much better just to stick to the columns and the beams and the sloping roof. Well, um, there were people who believed him, and they began to try to work out uh, the essence of perfect architecture, and like a lot of people in the rationalist camp, they look to pure geometry as the basis for it. Um, one of the architects who did that in the middle of the 18th century in France was Boulet, and that's simply an example of a Boulet building. Uh, it's circular, a pure geometric form, and it's pyramidal, another pure geometric form. I could have chosen other buildings by Boulet, Ledoux, or other architects of the same time, which were pure cubes, pure spheres, and so on. And when it came to any kind of architectural expression, they would follow Leger's advice and use the Greek orders uh, for their architectural form. One of the architects who was doing that towards the end of the 18th century in Paris was Gondouin with his medical school, which was built in 1770 uh, or so greatly admired building, and it comes very close to the kind of architectural purity that Loger was talking about. It's got a row of Greek ionic columns in this case, at ground level, and they're equally spaced, even though some of them have archways behind them, others have uh, blank panels of wall. It's architecture pared down, not quite to its absolute essence, but very nearly so. And the lecture theatre inside that is a very pure piece of architectural geometry. It's an exact semicircle with an exact semi-dome over the top. Or there's Rousseau uh, and this building, the Hotel de Saint, built in, in 1780 or so. Well, this began to have some very interesting political implications because the American ambassador to, to uh, France at the time was not, none other than Thomas Jefferson, who was, as you know, an architect, uh, rather a good architect in many ways, uh, in addition to being a politician and many other things. And he was extremely anxious, as an American revolutionary, to design a form of architecture which was not English. In other words, America had broken, uh, broken away from being an English colony, uh, so Jefferson felt it necessary to develop architecture that was manifestly not derived from England, and of course the best he knew was France. Uh, not just Paris itself, where he certainly admired these buildings, but also some of the, even some of the Roman antiquities in southern France as well. And it's hardly surprising that when Jefferson came back home and designed his own house at Monticello, it should look very like the Hotel de Sam in its general arrangement. And you can find derivations for Monticello and other famous Jefferson buildings in France, in Paris, uh, around the 1770s, the 1780s. Well, the point is that uh, Jefferson is the author of uh, 
American Attitudes to Democracy, also the author of An American Style of Architecture. So it's hardly surprising that ever since, when people have been talking about democracy, and they're trying to express that uh, architecturally, they should look to Jeffers the Jeffersonian kind of neoclassical as the basis. Certainly, the planning of Washington, Washington itself is very strongly neoclassical, L'Enfant's plan, which Jefferson himself didn't like too much, and the American government continued to build in that same manner for another 150 years or so. First of all, with the Lincoln Monument um, by <coughs> Henry, who is it? Can't read my own writing, I'm afraid, but the Lincoln Monument, and also the Jefferson Monument, which was designed by John Russell Pope. I remember the first time I came to Washington, I thought how well situated that building is and what a sensitive piece of neoclassical design. I was ignorant of my architectural history. I didn't know that it was designed in 1933 and had been the subject of a great deal of protest by architects at the time in the United States, including Frank Lloyd Wright and the AIA and other architectural institutions who felt very strongly that it was no longer appropriate for the capital of the United States to express its reverence for one of its great president, presidents in this strict neoclassical manner. Uh, however, as I said, I didn't know that when I first saw it almost 40 years later, uh, and it didn't worry me at all. In fact, the building of that kind was built in 1933. Well, the amazing thing is that in the same years that the United States was building its monumental buildings like this, fascist Italy was being rather more experimental. On the whole, we tend to associate the idea of fascist architecture with buildings of this sort. This is Paul Trost, uh, Adolf Hitler's first architect, and his building in the straight neoclassical manner. It's the Museum of German Art in Munich, and this also was designed in 1933. What he's done is to take uh, the straight prescription from Logier of what architecture consists of. It consists of columns and beams and very little else. And he's even left off the sloping roof. And it's hardly surprising because the model is one of the purest of all neoclassical buildings. It's the Altus Museum in Berlin by Karl Friedrich von Schinkel, designed around 1820 again according to the neoclassical prescription. Uh, the columns and the beams and everything else. There are walls behind the, the row, of, row of columns, but they're hidden in shadow. And an amazing range of architects have drawn on that building as the basis for their architectural attitudes. I have a tape recording at home, for instance, of Mies saying that he learned everything in architecture by the study of this building. And you can see what he means. If you translate the ionic columns into steel eye sections and the entablature into horizontal steel eye section and you fill in the space with grass uh, rather than leaving it open, then you don't need walls behind it and you get very nearly as, as pure as Logier wanted architecture to be. The columns, the beams and nothing else at all. And that's the case with Mises Crown Hall and other buildings of that sort, derived directly from Schinkel. Uh, when Mies himself came to the United States and started building in, in this form uh, at the IIT campus, he isn't following Schinkel quite so directly. Interestingly enough, what he is following is Nazi architecture of a utilitarian kind. This was built for Adolf or for Hermann Goering as uh, chief of the Air Force in Germany, and it's one of a number of Air Force stations built in that architectural language of, ex of a light exposed steel frame painted black and with brick panels in between and horizontal panels of window. Um, as I mentioned, the Italian fascists at the time were being a little bit more adventurous architecturally. There was Terragna, for instance, who actually built this uh, house for the fascists in Como, one of Peter Eisenman's favorite buildings. At the same time, uh, they were doing another thing. They were exploring architectural style. And curiously enough, all the fascist dictatorships have two things going in parallel. One is a straight neoclassical kind of architecture. 
The other is an architecture based on folk tradition, the reuse of the vernacular, this kind of thing. This is Lancia Amponti, its apartments in Milan, and they're drawing on uh, a regional vernacular with shallow brick arches in the penthouse of this, this building, also built around 1933. But on the, uh, the major uh, totalitarian monuments, of course, were built in Nazi Germany. This is Hitler's own study. And these are buildings designed for him by Albert Speer, his own architect, who's uh, described uh, what it was like to be the architect for Hitler and other aspects of life in Germany at the time. The Olympic Stadium in Berlin of 1936. And the enormous um, field for political demonstrations, the Zeppelin Field in Nuremberg. All the things set up with a Nazi ceremony and searchlights uh, forming those column-like objects in the background called the Cathedral of Light, for obvious reasons. Well, in talking about fascism, we're talking about a kind of government that believes that some races are superior to other races, um, that governs by force, that governs by an elite who make the decisions and pass those decisions down to other people, is totalitarian in terms of making everyone conform to its system and, on the whole, tends to destroy its enemies, uh, imprison them, kill them. So, buildings of this sort, uh, the, the monuments of Nazi Germany, are direct expressions of political power of exactly the kind that the early pyramids were. By the 1940s, the Italian fascists were beginning to work more in the neoclassical manner as well. This is the building they built for an, inter an international exhibition in Rome that never actually got opened, uh, but it's the same kind of architectural language. It's the neoclassical used to express the power of the fascist state. But just as the Italian fascists had their var variations on the neoclassical and the folkloristic, so did the Germans. This is a Hitler Youth Hostel, based obviously on the regional vernacular. And the Hermann Goering Youth Hostel, the same kind of thing. So what's a little bit confusing about that is that the same or very similar architectural forms are used by rather different political systems. American democracy uses the neoclassical for its monuments. So does fascist Germany, so does fascist Italy, so does fascist Spain for that matter. I think in a sense, uh, in looking at those political systems, it's not so much a matter of the architectural language they use. What we have to look at is the range of building types they build. And if you take the whole range of building types built by those dictatorships, they extend to things like the concentration camps, for instance. Auschwitz itself was built in this kind of regional folklore vernacular. So, in my view, there's a very clear architecture of capitalism, and it's based on the frame. It goes back to the 18th century, comes right forward into the 20th century. Uh, the fascist governments have a much more mixed uh, kind of architecture expression. But the key to this is what, does, what do the Marxist governments do? Well, the first group of Marxists to seize political power, of course, were in Russia in 1918. Um, and they had available to them some extremely advanced thinking in art and architecture. Moscow itself had been a seething ferment of constructivism, all kinds of other isms, offering uh, new kinds of art, new kinds of architecture. They used those artists to some extent in making political posters, designing uh, political exhibitions, um, and from time to time they used them as architects as well. One of the clearest examples is this exhibition for the Russian government at the Paris exhi uh, Exhibition Pavilion, the Paris Exhibition of 1925 by Melnikov. That was actually built. This one wasn't. It's a Lenin Institute, a kind of communications center um, by Leonidov. Uh, simply a beautiful constructivist ideal. And Le Corbusier and the other architects of the West were extremely anxious to help the revolutionary government if they could be helped. Le Corbusier himself designed this Centre Soyuz building and it was partly built and still exists 
partly built in 1929. But then in 1932, this became the adopted style of the Russian Marxist government. And the reasons for that are interesting. This is a competition drawing by Yofan and Sohuko for the Palace of the Soviets competition. Um, as you might expect, the competition itself had a wide range of entries, including entries from architects in the West, including architects by the constructivists. But this, is, this was the design that was chosen, and the reason is quite simple. Joseph Stalin, ruler of Russia at the time, uh, went to see the jury in session and said, that is the one. Uh, his taste ran to the grandiose neoclassical, just as Hitler's had, just as Napoleon's had for that matter. Um, in fact, Napoleon is the important link in all of that, that the kind of neoclassical architecture I mentioned that was available for Jefferson's pleasure in Paris was also available for Napoleon's. When Napoleon had buildings built, they were in that manner too. So it's hardly surprising that the European dictators of the 1930s, uh, when they were trying to express their political power, they looked back to the greatest of them all, Napoleon himself, and chose the kind of architecture he'd used for his monumental buildings too. Uh, so this won the Palace of the Soviets competition, and from then on, the, neo, the monumental neoclassical became the official government style. Uh, this is a block of apartments in Moscow, it's now the in-tourist office, and the Moscow underground, of course, the subway, that's also, uh, the, the, the railway stations are styled in this way too. And Moscow University is one of the largest of the wedding cakes. In fact, the Moscow skyline has seven buildings of this sort visible. Moscow University, hotel, various other building types as well, all built in that way because that was the personal taste of Joseph Stalin. But curiously enough, um, Soviet Russia also developed a quite different kind of architecture. They didn't invent it, but they developed it. And that was building large numbers of apartments with large panels of concrete, concrete slab construction. That became available to them because uh, several Marxist architects from Germany, particularly Ernst May, obviously had to leave that country when Hitler came to power, and they went to work in Moscow and took with them architectural ideas they, were they had been developing in Germany before Hitler, especially in Frankfurt. These are buildings built in that way in Frankfurt, and before 1939, just a few examples of that sort of building had been built. That caught the imagination of the next of the Russian leaders, Nikita Khrushchev, who thought it was a superb way to build, actually set up a research institute to prove that that was the perfect way of making architecture. Uh, and therefore, Russian development with that sort of construction was very rapid indeed. It spread around the rest of the world as well, around Europe, certainly, uh, Western Europe as well as Eastern Europe. But a lot of the uh, development work in the first place of how to use large slabs of concrete, perhaps with windows in them like that, uh, was done in Russia and Eastern Europe generally. Uh, Quite a few of the major textbooks were written by Poles, by Russians, by other people. In fact, I don't think it's possible to say that that's a true expression of any political system, but it is a true expression of something else that's just as important. I mentioned earlier on that it was very much part of Lenin's program that there should be no highly paid bureaucrats in his perfect state. Um, but there would be bureaucrats, uh, which is certainly true. And when you think about it, prefabricated building systems and particularly large panel concrete construction is the ideal bureaucratic architecture. Uh, and that's why it's, it's been built in such very large quantities in Eastern Europe and in West, Western Europe too, for that matter. Different political systems, but the same kinds of bureaucratic attitudes. So that's what's being expressed in that case. That particular photograph, if I asked you to, to identify where it is, I guess you'd have the greatest difficulty it could literally be anywhere from England to France, across Germany, across Poland, to Moscow, and even further east than that. It so happens it's northern France, but it's the, that kind of um, grey, 
concrete bureaucratic architecture that the Russians pioneered so strongly. We've got it in Portsmouth, that's Portsmouth, England, uh, contrasting with what Portsmouth used to be like. Or another example in Portsmouth, England, this is called Cannock Lawn, and it's reached the architectural history books, or will do before too long, as the first example in British legal history uh, of a particular kind. The concrete panels in this case are made up of a sandwich, thin skin of concrete, uh, we call it polystyrene. Do you use that word for insulating material? And then another thin sub of concrete. Well, all kinds of tests at the Building Research Institute proved that that was a good kind of wall panel in terms of, sand, of, of thermal insulation properties and so on. What they forgot is that if you take real workmen and put them onto a real building site, they throw the material, material around and the polystyrene cracks and it makes capillary tubes running through it. So not surprisingly, the wallpaper started peeling off and people's suits got mouldy. It was so damp. Well, for the first time in British legal history, the tenants of those houses brought an action against the Corporation of Portsmouth uh, to have the building put right. They won their case and Portsmouth Corporation were instructed to put the building right in consultation with the Portsmouth School of Architecture. And that's never happened before in the court of law. Um, this is Ronan Point, London. Again, it's the same kind of architecture, but it marks some kind of turning point in Britain. Uh, there's a gas explosion on about the fourth floor of this block of flats, and the concrete panels simply blew out like playing cards, and the whole of the corner of the building collapsed. That's a closer view of the collapse. So we stopped building them after that, but other countries are still doing it. And whilst that uh, Ronan Point itself is what captured the public imagination, uh, suggesting that perhaps that wasn't a reasonable way to live, and even in uh, the Russian experience, the buildings themselves are so badly made, they leak so much, the sound insulation is so terrible that people really don't like living in them. This is the nicest little bit of architectural criticism I know, uh, and it simply says that kind of architecture is strictly for the birds. However, it's still being built, as I mentioned, at points further east. This is Peking, and that's a fairly recent issue of the Peking Architectural Journal which shows, uh, the, the magazine is written in Chinese, but with introductory paragraphs in English, and every description of the construction of buildings like this starts off in attacking the ideas of Confucius and also Lin Pao, this is the kind of architecture we're going to do. And then they describe building construction of just the sort I've been talking about, large panels of concrete and so on. So uh, it could be Peking, uh, there's a hotel built in this way quite recently. And there's, I think, uh, a nice device. You see apartments up to six stories in Peking have no elevators. So this is a walk-up trolley. You push it and it walks upstairs for you. So Chinese urban architecture has become in, uh, come to be in that international bureaucratic manner uh, country housing is a different story. In many ways, the one place where, the, where Marx's own program for the perfect society perhaps works is the Chinese village, um, except that, uh, that there, for this village where, where the houses are, there are stories about one rebel who, having uh, bred a pony, sold it at profit to himself, which is a, a disastrous thing to do, and built a house that was different from other people's, and he was greatly um, despised by the rest of the villagers. And I think the, uh, the thing comes full circle with one of the most recent buildings, certainly the most recent building I shall show, the mausoleum to Chairman Mao, uh, opened only two months ago, uh, which could be the Lincoln Memorial. So again, even the Chinese communists, in trying to make a city center monumental building in, in memory of one of their great heroes, choose yet again uh, that same neoclassical architectural manner I was talking about. Well, all of that
that is architecture realized, but in Europe certainly um, there are very vocal Marxist architects who attach their ideas to specific architectural form. Classical buildings, and then he makes designs. Uh, a week ago, I would have uh, described this to you as an extremely sterile exercise in pure architectural form with no social content at all, even though the architect himself protests its political affiliations. It's uh, designed for cemetery at Modena. But on Saturday, I saw this in an exhibition in New York City, and it is one of the most beautiful architectural objects I've ever seen. So I have to withdraw my criticism of it uh, that I might have made earlier on. Or Rossi's design for the egalitarian city of the future, uh, based on uh, the same kind of construction we've been talking about, a pared down neoclassical, uh, where no house sticks up higher than any other. Uh, everyone is housed in these uniform apartments. Or the Creer brothers, architects from Luxembourg, um, Leon Creer, who's designed for La Villette area of Paris, is an attempt to create a new monumentality to express the social structure of the city in the future. He says that in the past, the city itself has been articulated around monumental buildings like town halls, cathedrals, churches, and so on, um, that if, uh, a particular, if his political stance means anything, it means that the city itself will be articulated in rather a different way. So his, he builds a large axis at the center of his city. It runs east to west on the slide. Have we lost the light? OK. Um, but like so many of the European rationalists, it pursues a, a form of architectural abstraction, I think, uh, a very long way indeed. There's uh, the main axis at the center with the various buildings labeled. Will it focus a little bit better? I can't do it from here. Well, I think uh, it used to worry me that the people who would turn every architectural discussion into a question of social and political issues were designing what seemed to me to be such sterile architecture. And then I realized that there is perhaps a consistency about it, and that cons the consistency genuinely is the rational ideal, which is simply abstraction. It's an abstract view on people, human relationships, an abstract view on what architecture should be as well. One of the more interesting people who protests his Marxist views in terms of uh, describing his architecture is uh, Kulo in Brussels. And his technique is to, uh, when the center of Brussels is threatened by what he and his students considers to be some unfortunate development, another high-rise office block, that kind of thing, uh, they go and look at the neighborhood, examine it carefully, and then make alternative design. Uh, what they think should be put there, perhaps housing rather than offices, uh, different kinds of building form. Uh, one of the things they're quite prepared to do is to take the same area and simply design in whatever style you like. So in the top left-hand corner, uh, they take a French fishing port, and in the bottom right-hand corner, they take the international style, and in between, they draw on Aldo van Eyck, uh, other architects they admire. The same general building form for housing, but simply giving people a choice of what kind of architectural forms they would like, what kind of detailed treatment they would like. But unfortunately, the rationalist architecture that's actually been built so far, this is Carlo Aymonimo, seems to uh, bear out those worst fears of an abstract view on humanity, an abstract view on architecture, abstract architecture actually built. So the question is, what can we do about all that? Um, one of my conclusions is that from time to time, a specific political belief finds its architectural expression, and I really do think that was true of capitalism. Uh, that many political systems find it necessary to prepare memorials for their great leaders. What's interesting is that both the United States of America, as a, as a capitalist democracy, 
and Maoist China choose the same building form to house the remains of their great leaders. Um, but surely behind all of that, if we're really talking about uh, a political belief that's, uh, that's based on people, on uh, not exploiting and so on, then we ought to be able to do better than the kind of abstraction that the rationalists are offering us. There are beginnings of attempts to do that. Um, this is one of the most notable buildings in Britain over the past five years or so, designed by Ralph Erskine, an English architect working in Denmark most of the time, but occasionally in Britain, who was asked to make some housing for the city of Newcastle. Very difficult site, covered with slums, narrow streets, with a new motorway to go past one edge of the site. His technique was to go into the community and buy an old house, or rather an old shop, and literally set up shop as an architect there. Uh, to have his architects working there in the shop window, to have anyone who cared to, to come along, look at what they were doing, criticize it, uh, make their own suggestions. School kids would go in and draw what they would like. Old age pensioners would go in and criticize what the architects were doing, suggest changes, and so on. It was a, a, a genuine attempt at participation by the community in the design of the buildings for their own use. In fact, the result is almost exactly what Erskine would have done anyway and has done in other places. But the involvement of people in the building up stage and the invitation for them to criticize means that the level of acceptance for that enormous complex of building uh, is very high indeed. People actually like living there very much, partly because they've got a choice between whether to live in the wall itself, which is nine stories high at peak, or in the single story, two story housing, grouped around pleasant courtyards at ground level. Well, that's a case that, in my view, transcends any kind of political system, uh, that uh, Erskine's politics are not important, that it's the intention of showing people what they could have, tapping their opinion, uh, removing what people dislike very much and simply finishing up with something that on the whole they find reasonably acceptable. Or it's happening in other ways as well. Um, in Britain, partly because of the state of the economy, partly because of uh, architects' beliefs, a great deal of energy is being put into the uh, renewal and conservation of old buildings rather than into the design of new ones. There was a time, and you can see from this poster in someone's window, when this house was threatened by the building of a new road. Well, the road program in Britain has been criticized so heavily by various pressure groups that now it's been abandoned. There will be no more motorways built, uh, partly because of the state of the economy, but partly because of public protest. What I find very interesting about that, uh, and this is, the kind, this is how that house will be when it's been refurbished, is that the city of Portsmouth, for instance, makes a very considerable sum of money available these days for people who live in these old streets. There was a time when it would go into the old streets and decide what should be done. But now what it does is to call a public meeting, um, invites people along. If a particular street is not represented, it actually go, the uh, city officials actually go around knocking on doors and ask people to come to the meeting, represent their point of view. Uh, the people make suggestions, the planners then act, act as technicians making drawings of what the people say they would like to do to improve their neighborhood. What I can't resolve in all of this is that this housing, which the people themselves like very much, they like the social relationships that it makes possible, the idea of coming out of their own front door and going into their neighbor's door or walking across the street, they like the scale of it, the general sense of humanity, especially when, it when the money has been made available for planting some trees and painting the whole thing. The housing itself was built in the 19th century at the height of that kind of capitalist depression I was talking about earlier on. In other words, the people who built the cotton mills of the sort uh, that I showed a slide of also built housing for their workers to live in. At that time, perhaps it was an exploitive thing to do, at the moment, it's very much what people like. If this were London, it wouldn't be lived in by people who work in the dockyard like it is in Portsmouth. It would be lived in by quite rich middle class people who very much like little street houses of that sort. 
So even that builds in a further paradox, that architecture that was built for the worst of motives finally becomes what people want very much. Um, so I think the, what I'm, I'm, I'm saying at the end of all this is that the political system itself has a very complex relationship with architecture. Sometimes it's directly expressed in the forms, that architecture, uh, forms of architecture that are built, sometimes it's not. Uh, but there's no very clear-cut relationship. Certainly, political systems and political pressures uh, help determine what is built and perhaps where it's built as well. But the relationship between architectural style, architectural manner, and political ideology is by no means as clear-cut as some people would like it to be. Thank you. Now for the arguments. I thought you might like to see what one expression of political ideology. <laughs> that, that was done by some of the Lamborghini Marxists I talked about. <laughs> regimes were using almost identical forms uh, to express quite different things. And I thought, well, how can that be? If there is any direct relationship at all between architecture and politics, that cannot happen. But it did happen. Would you like to elaborate that a little further? No, I'm Also, I think, um, when it became clear that some of those political systems had a tremendous variety of architectural expression, that on the one hand the neoclassical for their monumental city centre purposes, on the other hand the regional vernacular to express their kinship with the folk and the earth and the soil and those things. But what I haven't uh, finally resolved is why so many people in architecture, and in architectural education particularly, really post-1968 should still find it necessary to move every architectural discussion onto the political plane. That's really at the back of what I'm trying to argue with myself. They do it, they continue to do it. Why, when the relationship is so tenuous? In other words, I'm perfectly happy for them to hold whatever political belief system they, they wish to, what worries me is that if we're trying to talk about architecture, even about housing to satisfy humanity or whatever it is, still the argument is shifted onto the political plane, and I still don't know why. Yes. You imply that the example of participation was not ideologically motivated, that that was not in itself a political ideology? It's not overt in the sense of some of the other things I was talking about. I think if, uh, if you asked Erskine about his politics, he would not claim to be Marxist. He would be old-fashioned liberal, perhaps. But he wouldn't argue about it. But that is an ideology, isn't it? It is an ideology, but it's, uh, in that case, it's not at all a matter of reducing the architectural debate to political debate. The discussion is about architecture and about the kind of housing that satisfies people. And that seems to be a more constructive play. Mm. But there seems to be some sort of gentrification of the architect moving into the neighborhood and still retaining that design for one class of people. And I didn't see any situation where you showed an architect or an ideologue able to grasp a heterogeneous number of people with different value systems and come up with a solution for those people. What I'm implying is that there are areas in the world where these things, where people of different classes live together. One good example is Covent Garden. Right. It's gradually being taken over by the middle class, but many years it was with all classes of people. And 
harmony. And I've uh, yet to see, well, I think it's a contradiction to have the heroic architect designing for one class of people. I don't see that as any clear cut example of a democratic situation. Because to me, democracy is all classes of people living in harmony. What's interesting about that one is that there have been instances, I think, uh, the, the classic is Le Corbusier's Unité d'Habitation in Marseille, isn't it, which was designed for the uh, people who were bombed out of the docks of Marseille during the war, and then, because it was an architectural monument, became very desirable for the middle classes, and as you walk down the corridors, you see architects' names on the door, uh, not at all workers from the dockyard. And the same thing has happened in uh, one or two other cases. The, the Spanish architects I've written about from time to time, the Talia de Arquitectura. Uh, in some cases, they've designed housing for the very poorest people in Spain. Again, because it's architecturally desirable, the middle classes have moved in and pushed them out. In the case of Baika, that's not happened, and I think it's entirely a matter of location. But if it were in another part of the city, then that mixing process would be taking place. But I don't think it's got very much to do with actual architectural form. Again, that's, um, in a sense, an international symbol. Um, the Talia d'Architectura designing the, exactly the housing I was talking about. Uh, the building forms themselves are basically fairly cubic. But they did surveys. Uh, they, have two, they had two ways of making surveys of what people thought they should do to the housing to give it the expression of home. And in one case, they used sociological techniques. And certain answers came back from that. In another case, they, they, a member of the design team is a, is, is a poet, and he simply talked to people who wrote poetry about them. And the conclusion from both of those is that for the Spanish, the Spaniards of the of cent of central Spanish coast, the pitched roof symbolizes home. Uh, and in Britain, I don't know if you have things called building societies, they, they loan money for people to build houses. Again, one of the largest in Britain has a symbol which is uh, very well known of a couple walking down the street with an umbrella, and the umbrella is in the shape of a house roof. So I think there is something universal about that. And uh, the reason, I guess, why you get so much of it here in the United States is it's the first thing that think, people think about when they really get very tired indeed of the straight up and down rectangular block. The next thing is to put a sloping roof onto it again. I'm not familiar enough with it. I, I guess the building types I've seen it applied to are first of all housing, and then maybe to roadside uh, cafes, that kind of thing. Is that right? Uh, office buildings, really? Yeah. Well, first of all, the building types themselves, they're not on the whole social, socially motivated housing, are they? They're, they're profit-making buildings. So I, I think you're probably right. This is Charles Jenks's uh, idea of the language of postmodern architecture. Well, Charles's story, which I have a great deal of sympathy for, is uh, the Charles starts by being very bored with the international style, with Mies, with Corbu, and the rest of them. Not only bored, but he uh, he says almost some of the things I've been talking about as well. That uh, that architecture in itself 
is a direct expression of the capitalist economy and all those things. Um, so he says that uh, because the intention then was to make the perfect architecture for the whole world, that the first thing we've got to do to break away from it is to uh, bring in a variety of possibilities, which is where his, I don't, I don't like his word pluralist at all, but uh, in a sense what Charles is saying, if we're trying to get rid of that, then literally anything goes. Bring it all in and we'll see what happens. Um, what's not emerged clearly enough yet is whether there are any correlations between what, what comes in architecturally and the social ideas, ideals behind it. In uh, the early moment of our contact with Jeffrey Broadband, we asked him to uh, deliver a talk on England and particularly on Portsmouth. We thought that this could tie well into the preparation of the four-year trip. Uh, later on, we changed our, our mind. We uh, wanted this talk, but we didn't I didn't advise him. And uh, Jeffrey came with the slides on Portsmouth, and the slides are upstairs there. And they're not very many. And uh, I, for myself, would like to see them. I wonder whether uh, you would like to go through them very, very quickly. Uh, would, there be any, would you want to stay five, ten minutes more and uh, see those slides? Well, there are, there are two reasons why I thought it might be nice to do that. And one is because I know that some of you are, you are coming to England, and I hope very much you will visit us in Portsmouth and come and see us in the school and talk to our students and our faculty. The other is because, as um, I mentioned at the start, I found the book I'm writing at the moment extremely difficult to put together. Uh, partly because uh, only recently the idea of even trying to approach the subject of architecture and ideology came into the manuscript. But also because it's, uh, it's about a set of complex ideas, why it is that architecture changes over the years. And what finally convinced me to, uh, to start the book in a quite different way was one of those chance conversations between my father-in-law and uh, a doctor friend of ours who happens to be on the city council about the nature of planning in the city of Portsmouth. And it occurred to me that the route I take each day from my house to the School of Architecture literally passes through the development of architecture and planning theory over the past 150 years, spelled out street by street. So the book itself is going to start with a photo montage of that walk with descriptions of the, the, the buildings en route and then discussions of the theoretical premises behind them, why architecture was done that way. Well, I won't go through that now, but I will just put it into context. And some of the buildings I'll show are going to be parts of that route. Uh, so could we have the lights down? Well, the first thing about Portsmouth as a city is that it's an island. And it's uh, a bell-shaped island on the south coast of Britain, opposite the Isle of Wight. And this is the view from Portsmouth towards the Isle of Wight, with the church spire in the distance, which makes the stretch of water itself, the Solent, one of the most interesting in the world. When we had a, a British Navy, uh, lots of the British Navy used to pass up and down here. The ships from New York to Southampton still do, that kind of thing. It's also... Uh, great sailing water, and you must have heard of Cow's Week, uh, one of the, uh, for, for the people who sail boats, one of the highlights of the year. One of the reasons I put this slide on, 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 the, on the screen is the strange object at the left-hand side, which is a fort. Now, Portsmouth Harbour was very important in the 19th century, and in the 1860s, Palmerston, who was the Prime Minister, decided that the French weren't to be trusted. Uh, they might attack Portsmouth at any time. So the whole city is ringed by forts. There are four of them actually in the water like that. And the idea is that if the uh, French ships came sailing up the Solent, they would fire guns at them. And there's another ring of forts, uh, star-shaped, the, on the hills around Portsmouth as well. So every part of the city could be fired at with guns at any time. I think they've taken most of the guns away, but still, uh, it's an in interesting feature of the city. Um, and again, just to confirm that it is a seaside resort uh, with uh, beach. This is, happens to be the outfall to the sewage works, but it doesn't make it any less interesting. But there are fortifications going back way beyond that uh, to the time of King Henry V. 
Um, again, the British kings used to sail from Portsmouth to France when they were fighting wars with the French. And the beginnings of these fortifications here that go right down into the water are right back in the Middle Ages. The square tower in the distance, the one absolutely to the right of the screen, that used to be a signaling station. Uh, the ships of the British fleet would be lined up in the Solent and the Admiralty in London would want to send messages to the fleet and they didn't have any telephones and carrier pigeons were too slow. So they had a signaling system uh, built on various hilltops between London and Portsmouth and they would send the signals from hill to hill and that was the last one before the message went out to the ships themselves. This is South Sea Castle, um, actually designed by King Henry VIII himself. Uh, it's uh, an amazing square keep, as you can see, with star-shaped fortifications around it. Uh, and it's now a museum on the history of the city of Portsmouth that shows the development over the centuries. Uh, interesting for other reasons as well, uh, the actual construction we'll look at in a minute. One day, King Henry VIII was standing on South Sea Castle, reviewing his ships as they went past, and one of them suddenly turned over and sank, the Mary Rose. And about five years ago, that was discovered, it's in the mud off Portsmouth, and they're now excavating it. And if some kind American gives them several million pounds, they'll bring it to the surface and put it on display. This is the interior of South Sea Castle, which as you can see is brick arches, and like nothing so much as Le Corbusier Jarl houses, I always think. Some very amazing interiors. Then uh, the dockyard itself, there are still ships in the current British Navy, but the prize exhibit is, is Nelson's flagship, the Victory, uh, which fought at the Battle of Trafalgar in 1815. Uh, was very badly damaged, Nelson was shot, carried down below and died there. But they brought the ship back to Portsmouth. I think uh, she continued in active service for a little while longer in the British Navy, uh, but then was put on display and is now in a dry dock and has largely been rebuilt. The timbers, of course, have rotted over the years. So every time you go to the Victory, they've cut up another section of floor, but some new boarding there instead. But still, the, there's, there's quite a bit of the original and it's, uh, Extraordinary, an extraordinarily interesting thing to see because it shows you the living conditions for 800 men in the early part of the 19th century. Most of them didn't want to be there. They'd been uh, maybe found drunk wandering the streets of Portsmouth and seized by the king's men and taken onto the ship and kept there at gunpoint. Um, they were press ganged, in other words, and th th this, is th that's, this is where they had to live and work. But the ship itself is a, a very beautiful object, irrespective of the social conditions that went on inside it. That's uh, an interior showing, one, showing the living space. Each of those tables housed eight men and a, uh, a young boy, age 11, 12 or 13, who used to do the fetching and carrying. Uh, and the various containers uh, were for uh, food and rum. Uh, they, the, the, the sailors got an enormous allocation of rum each day and they certainly needed it. Uh, and there's a spittoon which they had to spit into because spitting on the floor was punishable by a hundred lashes or something. The guns themselves are no longer original. They're replaced with wooden uh, models, full size, uh, because they're simply too heavy for the old timbers of the ship to sustain. But there are originals grouped around the ship now but it must have been quite appalling to live and work under those conditions. And sleeping consisted of having hammocks, uh, as there are some rolled up, you see, simply strung between the beams of the deck. This is in South Sea Castle, and it uh, also has connections with Nelson's victory. The very first factory production line in the world was set up in Portsmouth Dockyard for making the blocks for the rigging of the victory. Yes, you can see uh, the ropes every so often there's a black blob on, on the photograph there. Well, that's a block of wood with pulleys inside it and the ropes passing around it. And uh, they, they used to be carved by hand, but that was a long and laborious and expensive process. So Brunel, 
the great engineer, designed machinery for making those things by hand, and the first system anywhere of having a whole row of machines in line with a square block of wood at one end, first machine saws off the corners, second machine rounds the sides off, third machine uh, drills a hole through the middle, that kind of thing. They were set up in the dockyard, and there are still some machines in the dockyard. There's a set of them in South Sea Castle in the museum, and another set in the Science Museum in London. But still, it's a great place for sailing. Uh, amateur yachtsmen uh, sail there all the time. Cows Week I've mentioned, uh, that's the annual event in August each year. And every two years, there's this event, which is the Tall Ships Race. Um, about 32 of these ships still survive, uh, and they, uh, there's great competition for people to act as crew on them. This is, this is an American entry, as you can see. And they race to various places. Sometimes they race across the Atlantic, sometimes around to different parts of uh, the British coast or to France or whatever. But the seafront itself is a great place for spectacular occasions, powerboat racing as well. The Isle of Wight is connected to Portsmouth with uh, a regular hovercraft service. That's probably the first one to, to have uh, ever run, and it's still running. It takes seven minutes to cross those two miles of water in this strange craft. Portsmouth Cathedral, um, not a very beautiful cathedral, but a, quite a historic one in many ways. Um, greatly restored and added to in the early years of this century. We've used it, uh, the School of Architecture have used it from time to time. Um, like you, we like to do projects in the community. In other words, to uh, look at Portsmouth, to design re or redesign part of it. And in this case, uh, we, the, the students have been designing projects for the area around the cathedral in Portsmouth. So we hired the cathedral, which is a better, much better exhibition space than cathedral, and put on display the work of the students. And people came in and commented, and uh, we held a public meeting to get feedback from them. The result of that was so successful that even the Portsmouth city planners were quite impressed. And we're going to rework that whole exercise this year, involving other parts of the polytechnic, the geographers, the sociologists, and so on, in addition to the architects. That's the view from my window, with the cathedral there in the distance. The old School of Architecture building was just to the left of that. This is where Juan worked when he, he was with us. The power station at the uh, right is going to be demolished. It's not in use anymore. And there in the foreground is a cricket field. Um, and I'm sometimes asked by visitors to explain what's going on. Well, I don't really know, except I think it's some kind of rainmaking ceremony. Now, this is part of my walk uh, from my house to the School of Architecture, and it passes through a little bit of Portsmouth designed in the picturesque manner of the early 19th century of each house slightly different from the house next door. The house on the left is Gothic, with Gothic detail, pointed windows, and so on. Uh, the house behind is obviously classical. The house behind that is neoclassical. Then, uh, in a sense, that represents Portsmouth's very small scale version of the kind of planning that John Nash was doing in London in the early years of the 19th century. Then, uh, shortly after that, I cross this main road, which is call, called Elm Grove, because it used to be lined with elm trees. It was Portsmouth's answer to the boulevards of Paris, designed by Haussmann. It was lined, as you can see, by rather splendid Italianate villas, uh, and most of them still exist in the background, but what they did is to chop down all the trees and extend them forward to make shops. Then a little bit further along the same road, um, one of the Portsmouth architects answered to Le Corbusier, uh, the idea of each house with its little balcony built into a slab. Uh, this is a fairly early translation in, in English terms of the Corbusier unité d'habitation idea. Uh, immediately around the corner, the typical Victorian housing, which amazingly enough is prefabricated building system in that all the uh, stonework you, you can see is artificial stone, precast to give the shape of the doorway, the windows, 
And all the builder needed to do is to buy those things out of the catalogue and then fill in the spaces between with bricks. Then further along the route, um, this uh, is called Winston Churchill Avenue. Uh, recently, most of the street names in central Portsmouth were renamed uh, after historic figures. The School of Architecture used to be in a place called, very nice, I thought, Park Road, and now it's called King Henry I Street, which makes it extremely expensive to send cables there. But this particular view, I think, is the nearest I know anywhere of a realization in built form of those Le Corbusier sketches from the 1920s of what the center of the view of ideas should be like, the motorway cutting through the middle and tall blocks of, of building either side. And I think that's the lot.